когда только начинаем. Вот я, например, считаю, что лучше работать в большой. Microsoft и, и же с ними. Потому что там, как минимум, бесплатные завтраки, занятия спортом, куча народу, и ты можешь говорить смело, что я работаю в Microsoft, а я работаю в Google. Что ты думаешь? Я думаю, что большие компании, это все-таки, с одной стороны, вроде как бы кажутся большие возможности, с другой стороны, гораздо большая конкуренция среди соискателей. В маленьком стартапе ты пришел, ты самореализовался, ты попробовал разные деятельности, а не какой-нибудь тебе выделили в корпорации, потому что очень крупно объявили, ты не очень до конца смотри. Вот, а ты там раз, раз, там, как себя применил, нашел, самореализовался стартап, допустим, сделал маленькая какая-то компания, там, другая атмосфера, другая атмосфера, мне это нравится. Ну, собственно, давайте послушаем, что нам скажет наш специальный гость, гость Шон Вайер. Приглашаем. Я благодарю вас за возможность приглашать меня сегодня. Спасибо всем. How are you? Fine. Fine. Good, good. I'm very glad to hear that. I, again, I want to express my appreciation for the chance to come and, and speak with you a little bit today. Uh, I'd like to start just by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Sean Weirich. Um, I'm from the state of Georgia in the U.S. Uh, you're paying attention. Excellent. Right. Uh, I'm married. We have three sons, uh, Gregory, David, and Yaramir. They keep us very busy. Uh, we've been in Tomsk since November of 2012, so about two and a half years now. And um, I currently teach English primarily in Benedict uh, School, but Olga told me that I had to make sure and say Rubius Language Center a lot. Rubius Language Center. So, here as you can see, uh, if you've forgotten your geography, that's where Georgia is located. It's in the southeastern part of the states. Uh, the weather's a little different from the weather in Tomsk. Uh, just a little bit. And uh, besides teaching English, um, I have around 10 years of management experience and I've had the chance to work in a variety of companies, ranging from small, privately owned businesses to large national chains. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of my observations about the differences between working in a small, private business and working in a larger company. Prior to moving to Tomsk, I was part of the management team of a uh, hospital system called Gwinnett Medical Center. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of the size of Gwinnett Medical Center, because I can imagine that you have a picture in mind of a hospital, a pretty big building, but not much more. Gwinnett Medical Center it consists of two full-size hospitals with emergency rooms. We have a separate women's pavilion for pregnancy and birth care. We have a nursing or extended care home for people who are older and can't take care of themselves. Um, we also have several other diagnostic facilities. So this is an entire complex of medical centers, of medical facilities. And uh, Gwinnett Medical Center employs over 4,200 people and it also has over 800 affiliated doctors that practice at the medical center. So whereas this company is not as big as say a Google or a Microsoft, it's not a small company. And in contrast, there are less than 30 people total that work, to, that work at Benedict right now. Um, many people, as we've said today, and the technology field is no exception, dream of working in a large company. Who wouldn't like to be the next Bill Gates, the next Steve Jobs, okay? And there are definitely advantages 
And so I wanted to talk with you about some of the things that draw or attract people to large companies. And probably the biggest one is, of course, pay and benefits. Okay? We all expect to get paid for our work, right? Who, who likes to get money for doing their job? Okay, this is pretty basic. And other benefits like insurance and paid vacation and things like that. These attract people to large companies, right? Um, and startups try to remain competitive, but they simply don't have the budgets that large companies have. So depending on what part of the world you live in, there may be a huge difference in what you can receive working for a small startup and what you can receive working for a large company. But another factor is other perks or advantages that other big companies can offer you. Small companies can't offer you large com campuses with gyms. They can't offer you catered meals. Most of them probably can't offer company cars and many other things like that that the large companies can um, give you. Uh, for example, here, we have a photograph of the Google employee gym and a photograph of just a few of the dishes served in the Apple cafeteria. I'm guessing most of your companies don't have something quite that large, right? Um, but of course, another perk for working for a large company is simply the prestige of working for a large, globally recognized company. Let's face it. It would be cool to have your name on an Apple business card. Okay? Hi, my name's Sean, and my business card is an iPhone screen. That's definitely a perk that uh, could attract people. And companies like Apple and Samsung and Google, they're names that people recognize all over the world. If you work for these companies, anywhere you go, people are going to know where you work. Outside of certain spheres, if you say that you work for Rubius, this is the picture that many people will have. You say Rubius, they think Rubius Hagrid. The prestige is not quite the same. Rubius Language Center. <laughs> so, one of the other large benefits that big companies can offer is the perception of stability. And people flock to companies because they think of the stability that they can have in their job. Okay? And in any country, the economy can be unpredictable. Many of the big companies across all industries that exist today have survived the up and downs of the economy, both locally and internationally. Uh, in the tech field, a lot of the companies that exist today have been able to survive not only the dot-com bubble of the late 90s, but more recent recessions and fluctuations. To give you a personal example, the reason that my family moved to Atlanta when I was a child was because my father was a programmer. And at the time, in the 1980s, Atlanta was a hotbed for tech startups. So what kind of experience did my father have? Layoffs, downsizing, headhunters. He had some successes, but until the economy became more stable and he was able to get in with a larger company, he experienced a lot of instability. So can large companies offer more stability? Yes. Are they immune, however? to the ups and downs of the economy. No, not by any means. Some people, however, are drawn to larger companies because they want the chance for the work they do to benefit more people. So I have a few questions for you. How many of you here have used Google? Mm -hmm. Microsoft Office? Lots of hands, right? Uh, any iOS users? A few. <laughs> to be fair, Android? We love you too. Uh, okay. Do any of you have a Windows PC at home or work? 
Okay. Somebody's code, somebody's hardware is affecting our lives. And the chance to have this kind of impact or influence on people can be a reason for people to try to get hired with a big company. And I think if you compare a client base of this scale with the client bases of your companies, you might see a little difference, right? Not a big one. So my question is, are there potential advantages to working for a big company? Obviously, there are. But there are also disadvantages as well. So let's take a few minutes and look at some of them. The first one is competition for jobs. <clears throat> it can be incredibly difficult just to get considered to be a potential employee of a big company. And while working at the hospital, I can remember how our HR department would get thousands of applications a week for any position available. It would get to the point to where they would have to take the position off of the website just so they could go through the applications they had already received before being able to receive any more. And all of that was so that the management team could choose one person out of thousands for each position. So now imagine how many applicants um, a large company like that probably gets a week. In his article entitled, If You Want to Build a Great Team, Hire Apple Employees, Wade Fulton states that only 7% of applicants get accepted to Harvard. Only 2% of applicants to Apple, however, get hired. There is a tremendous amount of competition for a limited number of jobs in big IT companies. And with HR companies weeding out or filtering applications, sometimes the only chance you have of even getting an interview is based on who you know as opposed to what you know or what you have accomplished. And with the competition so high, even knowing someone is far from a guarantee of getting hired. And in this day and age, we are all incredibly fortunate to have jobs. But should we need to change jobs, the chances of us getting a job in a smaller company are simply mathematically much greater. But should you get hired to a big company, you might see the next disadvantage uh, in our talk here and that is bureaucracy. In his article, Top 10 Reasons Why Large Companies Fail to Keep Their Best Talent, Eric Jackson lists big company bureaucracy as the number one reason for people leaving companies. As he says in his article, no one likes rules that make no sense. Nobody likes feeling that they are kept from doing the things that they need to do uh, by a mountain of senseless paperwork or not being able to get the right person in management to help you. To give you a personal example, in the hospital, if I wanted to get the PCs in our department defragmented, I had to submit a work order with our IT department for each PC each time I wanted it to happen. These PCs would run 24-7 using multiple programs with no regular maintenance. So what should have been a very basic function that any user could perform required formally getting the IT department involved every time we needed something done. Another example would be the office I worked in. It needed paint and it needed more cabinets. The office was tiny. But to get these minor repairs done, I had to get a work order approved by my manager, who had to get a work order approved by her manager, who then had to get the money approved from the budget. After doing all of these things, as far as I know, they still haven't been done. So the level of bureaucracy in a company is directly related to the next disadvantage of large businesses, which is the fact that the larger a company is, the more its employees are viewed <clears throat> as assets, 
as resources, and they're going to be limited by the plans and the needs of the company. This brings us back to Eric Jackson's article, and he states that bureaucracy being listed as the number one reason for people leaving really shows that the people in a company whose talents and skills drive the business's success don't feel that they have enough input or say in the direction of the business. And the sense that management doesn't listen, it drives away talented people. In his article, Up or Out, Solving the IT Turnover Crisis, <clears throat> Alex Papadimoulos suggests that one of the reasons that programmers leave IT company is that they get discouraged not seeing their ideas implemented on a routine basis. As he states, what was once fresh new ideas that we can't implement today become the same old boring suggestions that we're never going to do. He states further that ambition and skill go hand in hand. And ambitious individuals tend to want swift changes and quickly lose motivation when these changes don't happen. When skilled employees don't see quick change or implementation of their ideas, they get burned out and they leave. This tends to happen uh, faster in larger companies, especially since people in larger companies are not always open to the suggestions or ideas of the new guy. And another problem is that promotion in large companies is often based on tenure or the amount of time you have been at a company, not on what you have done or the amount of skill you have. So in order to get a better picture of ideas not being implemented, let's take a look at the number of patents filed by Apple, Google, and Microsoft in a year. As we can see from the graph, as of 2014, Apple had filed 10,500 patents since 1994, Microsoft, 19,400, and Google, 14,500. In 2014 alone, each company filed around 2,000 patents. Now, part of the strategy of filing so many patents is, of course, to keep other companies from developing and patenting the same technology, especially if the person whose idea this was goes to work for the competition. Another reason um, that they do this is just to have ideas for the future that they may be able to implement later. But how many new technologies did each of these companies actually release in 2014? I'm guessing it was less than 2,000, right? So how many ideas are the employees of these companies submitting but never seeing brought to life? And how would any of us feel if our ideas were considered good enough to patent, but never good enough to develop? We have to remember that employment is ultimately a business arrangement. As Alan Henry reminds us in his article, the company you work for is not your friend. Your time and your work are traded for money. And this is true no matter where you work. He goes on to remind us that companies have to look out for their interests, not yours, to survive. And as if we have, we have already stated, the uh, interests of the company and the interests of the uh, employees can be very different, and the interests of the company take priority. As Alan states in his article, sure, there are great jobs and companies out there that truly care about their employees, <clears throat> but these companies are rare, and you'll be lucky if you land a job with one of them. It's more likely that you'll find a team or a boss that cares about you enough to keep every day from becoming soul-crushing drudgery. The larger any company becomes, the more distant the relationships between its employees become, especially between staff and management. The more distant the relationships within a company become, the more the employees are viewed purely as resources. Employees may never meet or even see their CEOs or any member of the board of directors. That's not uncommon. In smaller companies, however, I think we can see a little different picture. We can see companies that do have close relationships, 
sometimes even friendships among people at all levels. There is also a much greater possibility of having more direct involvement and influence in the direction of the company. And this is due in part to the size of startups, but also to the fact that since small companies have fewer employees, each one is going to be more highly valued than in companies where there are thousands of employees. <clears throat> and this gives smaller companies a greater chance to invest in and develop the members of their teams. And it also fosters a culture of promoting from within. And what this all means is that your work is more likely to be noticed, valued, and rewarded. Of course, another advantage of being part of a smaller company is the opportunity not only to have new ideas, but to have them implemented, to have them become a reality. It's the chance to get in on the ground floor or to be part of starting and building something new and exciting from the beginning. Here you have the chance to introduce something new to the world or to improve on something that already exists. Now we've talked about some of the advantages of working for small businesses in general, but I really want to bring this home. How many local businesses are represented here today? If I understood correctly, it was supposed to be about 70 or so, right? Um, how many of you live in or work around Tomsk? Just about everybody, right? You may have a few other people, but most of us are, are in Tomsk right now. <clears throat> and since there are so many startups here in Tomsk, it stands to mention an advantage of being part of a small business here in Tomsk that may not be as obvious, and that is the chance to improve Tomsk. Tomsk obviously is known for its universities. We've talked about it a little bit earlier, that people come here from all over Siberia as well as from other countries just to study. The startups in Tomsk have the chance to let this town be known for its businesses as well. Small businesses have the chance to show further reaching results than just graduation rates. And we also have the chance to keep that success here and as we've seen before, success draws talent. People move to where the big successful companies are. So why shouldn't we continue to bring talented people to Tomsk? More talent coming to Tomsk has the potential not only to increase the success of existing businesses, but also to increase the number of new businesses that are started here. And a particular advantage that tech companies have is that they can easily partner with companies around the world, and they can also easily expand globally. They have the chance to get international recognition for Tomsk, or as we say, to put Tomsk on the map. As an English teacher here, I ask um, all of my students at the beginning of each, each year why they're studying English. And every year, I get at least one or two that tell me something like, my parents are making me study English so I can leave Russia because there is no future here. Think about that for a minute. Their parents are telling them, there's no future for you here, leave. I think that's a very flawed and very harmful mentality. Yes. Give your children every advantage you can. Yes, let them find out and experience as much of the world as possible. But don't forget that we have a chance to make a future for Tomsk right here. The people who use their talents and skills here, the people who create businesses that attract other talented people and give them a place to develop their ideas, they're the ones who are going to make a future for this town and its residents. So whereas there are definitely advantages um, and things that large companies can offer that small companies can't, I would challenge you to look at the businesses, uh, the benefits rather, that we've discussed today and to see that your companies really can offer you a good work environment with close relationships as well as the chance to have direct input and a real voice in your company. And they can also offer you the chance to see your ideas and your visions become a reality 
without the bureaucracy and office politics found in large corporations. And I think that if you think about it, you'll see the chance not only to write your success story, but to write the success story of college, all right here in your backyard. Thank you for your attention. Sean, thank you for your presentation. I have one question. You have told us that uh, there are advantages of small companies and disadvantages of big companies. And I wonder, uh, is it possible to keep the advantages of small company when the company becomes bigger? I mean that every company wants to, to, to be a big company, to increase, to grow, yeah, to develop things in different ways. And how we can to keep the advantages of a small company? Very good question. And uh, a lot of that, a lot of the atmosphere of any company is going to depend uh, in a large part on the management. Um, working in the hospital, one of the, one, of the, one of the values that we had, one of the things that all managers tried to do was have what we called an open door policy. That means that you should not be afraid to come and talk to me if you have a problem. You should not be afraid to ask me questions. And so in, in keeping that kind of mentality, that kind of uh, approach, I think despite the size of the company, at least in our individual departments, we were able to have good teams because management was there for its employees and the employees understood that. So it can be done, it just takes work. Good question, thank you. Thank you for speaking. My pleasure. Uh, I'd like to hear some words for uh, students, for new workers, for old workers, how to manage uh, themselves to moving from one company to another because uh, when large company uh, cut their resources and a uh, lot of people get stressed and they fear that they will never find a good job. What would you suggest them uh, to do? To go for another big company or to grow for their own startup or search for a similar small company? Okay, excellent question. And of course, the question of starting your own business versus working in another company, that is completely personal. But as far as the question of, about the job search in general, um, really, most people suggest that your job search should be continuous. Just because you have a job, it should not mean that you don't keep your resume or your CV updated. It does not mean that you shouldn't try to interview with other companies. And um, the more you look into the advice that um, people with a lot of business experience give, the more you'll see that you should be talking to people from other companies all the time. You should try to maintain a good professional network so that if something should happen, if you get to the point to where your company is laying people off, then you already have a relationship in another company and it becomes that much easier. It shouldn't be something to where you've worked in your own little company for years and years and years and you have no idea what's going around and then something happens with the economy and you're just stuck. So the, the best advice is maintain your resume, maintain your interviewing skills, keep in contact with people, and let the job search be something that you do on an ongoing basis. Because a lot of big companies especially, they're not looking for people who don't have a job. They want to find people who are working and who are successful and bring them to their companies. Thanks, Sean, for your talk. Uh, we all know that the management cultures are different between the US, for example, and Russia. So the cultures of people are different. And uh, what could you mention that we could pick up from the US style? And uh, maybe what should we be afraid of? So what are the pros and, pros and cons in terms of culture? OK. Um, it's going to be difficult for me to say a lot about Russian management style because um, Again, I, I work primarily at Benedict, and you know, if, if I have a question, I go to our director, who is a lovely old babushka, and we talk. Um, 
But some of the things that we really stress in management is, uh, first of all, leading by example. Do the things you want your employees to do. Don't be the kind of person who just walks around and says, do this, do this, do this, and then sits at the desk. Okay? And that doesn't mean that you have to do everything. Obviously, you have to be able to delegate, but your employees need to see a good example of good business ethics in you, first of all. The open door policy I mentioned uh, is very important because that keeps the lines of communication open. And I think we've already talked about when communication fails in business, then everything starts to fail. Um, and then another thing, this was kind of a particular thing that we tried to teach at the hospital itself, was um, we had to treat everybody as a customer. And to give you a, a better picture of that, in the hospital, I worked in the emergency room. I had to deal with my employees, I had to deal with patients, I had to deal with patients' families, I had to deal with doctors, I had to deal with police, I had to deal with firemen, I had to deal with emergency personnel. Basically, people from every part of city life there would come to the hospital. And our job, what we taught our employees to do was to treat each and every person, whether it's your coworker, whether it's your manager, whether it's the person that reports to you, as your customer and try to take care of their needs first. Now, does that mean you can say yes to everything? No, by, by no means. But when you try to show people that you are there to do a job and to help them do their job, then things go much easier. Hello, Sean. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to ask you, what was the reason for you to move in Tomsk? Why in Tomsk? Uh, what so attracted in our city? <laughs> um, everybody asks me that. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really kind of a long story. Um, <clears throat> the, short, the short version is that a friend of mine asked me to come with him uh, so that we could work with orphans or children who have no parents, just for a short trip. While I was here, I got offered a job and, and the chance to continue working with orphans while I was here, so my wife and I talked about it and we decided to move to Tomsk. What about Tomsk itself? Um, first of all, I have, I, I have to tell you, I, um, I have been to several Russian cities, and the first time I came, I noticed two things. First of all, uh, the town being a college or a university town, it reminds me of the town where I went to, to the university. And I liked that atmosphere, but I also noticed that the people in Tomsk are in general much more laid back, much friendlier than, I mean, even in like Barnum and Yerkuts, definitely Moscow and so other, other places that I've been. So just the atmosphere of the town and, and the people in general really have, have made it an attractive town. And uh, especially with three fairly small children, our, our kids are 10, 8, and 5, I can see that it's also a very good place to raise children. So there, there have been several things that I've liked about them. Thank you for asking. I love the forest. <laughs> Fresh air. Anybody else? Hello, Sean. Uh, Big company with a uh, small company. On my point of view, but from my experience, the answer is very simple. Work two years in big company, then two years in small company, and it will be best for self growing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, you know, with my experience working in little tiny companies and then working in larger companies, I agree um, that you can, you can stand to benefit from both environments. Um, what you prefer is going to depend on, on really where you end up and, and, and what your preferences are. I know, personally, I enjoy just being able to talk to people that I work with, not having to worry about work orders, things like that. Uh, the level of stress in a smaller company is usually much less. You don't have that feeling of management pushing on this management, pushing on this management, pushing on this management, pushing on you. So, um, again, there are disadvantages to both systems as well as advantages. Personally, I do like working in a smaller company, but 
I also try to look at every experience as something that I can learn from. So you can gain from both environments, really. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.